Hello and welcome to Louisiana World War II Stories. I'm your host, Charlie Winham. I'm at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. It was dedicated in 2000 as the National D-Day Museum and was renamed when Congress designated this facility as the country's official World War II Museum. Here, the museum brings to life the teamwork, optimism, courage, and sacrifice of the men and women who won the war and changed the world. And for the next hour, we will view a small sampling of some of those heroes from Louisiana. We begin with a young Army sharpshooter from Crot Springs, Louisiana. Charles Bro left his home in the peaceful Atchafalaya Basin and fought in the Battle of the Bulge, one of World War II's bloodiest moments. And even though his formal education only reached the second grade before being drafted, Charles Bro wrote down his World War II experiences in a journal. Charles Bro of Crot Springs left his job as a tugboat captain to become a sharpshooter in the Army. I learned that when I, when I first went, when well, I was a sharpshooter before I went in the Army. You were? Yeah, because I see I used to, I was raised in the base and we lived that way, hunting and fishing and, and hiding and sneaking around. We didn't have no blinds like they do now, they wait for them. We had to go hunt the stuff. Charles is a proud product of the Atchafalaya Basin, and if not for his service in World War II, he would have never left the comfort of the bayou. The infantry, you know how that was. I walked a many, a many a miles. I guess we walked halfway across to Europe. You sleep with your boots on, you didn't dare take them off. You didn't know when you got to get up and run. And although he didn't think much of it at the time, Charles, a man with a second grade education before being drafted, wrote down his experiences in a journal. Because of glaucoma, he can no longer read his own words written over 60 years ago. But his first line simply reads, my journey overseas. I left New York September 17, 1944, and landed in Liverpool, England on September 25, 1944. But we weren't supposed to do that. You know, they couldn't have nothing like that because they'd capture something that Germans would be bad on you. But I wrote that and I kept it in my duffel bag and I stayed in the truck all the time. Whenever they'd pull us back for a few hours, well, we'd they'd put our bags out. Well, then I'd take my journal out and write. But uh, I didn't know how to write too good in them days. I just guessed at it. I was in combat the whole two years I was over there. There was no, nothing but combat from one place to the other. Bro landed on Omaha Beach two weeks after D-Day. What did Omaha Beach look like then? <laughs> like I said, there wasn't no beach. It was just a junkyard. Wasn't nothing but blood, tore up boats and motors and all kind of stuff where they burned up and blew them up all over the beach. From there on, that's where the, we started rolling up across the France and Belgium and then places into Germany. Bro was a platoon leader and fought in the Battle of the Bulge. It was the bloodiest battle that U.S. forces experienced in World War II. Over 19,000 U.S. soldiers died, 23,000 more were missing or captured, and another 43,000 troops were injured. And then during the Battle of the Bulge, it was bad. But we, we stayed ahead of them, but it, it was rough. They shelled us and shelled us. We how, how, we didn't, how we made it through, I don't know. Did you have some close calls? Oh, yeah, I did. Uh, oh, yeah. They shot us and all. We stayed in like we stayed in the ground until they they shoot the dirt up around the hole. We didn't move. They didn't move at night. I had some close call. It was freezing then, cold. So we got in a a, a little barn like, and they blew that thing up with us in there. That was cool. And I had an overcoat on. I never noticed it. I felt the cold wind. And after that thing had settled down, somebody said, what happened to your coat? I looked, there wasn't no back on it. They shot the whole back off of my coat, my overcoat. I don't know how I made it. And I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say scared. You know, if we had something to do to go on a patrol or something, they sent us out at night. I didn't, I didn't tell them no or nothing. I'd, of course, they had a lot of men that didn't want to go. They, they'd have the shakes and they'd, I would leave them. I'd pick out, you know, because I, I could pick out whoever I wanted to go with me. 
and we had to send them out. Sometimes we send patrols out, and you never see them come back. So that's that's how dangerous it was. It wasn't, it wasn't easy. A personal collection of World War II artifacts was mostly forgotten by Charles, but kept by his daughter Carolyn. The Army misspelled his hometown on his dog tag, calling it Crit Springs, Louisiana. And then there is a swastika patch Charles recovered when he and his troops took over a small European town. We caught up with them Germans laying out the communication line. It was pulling it up to the, to the courthouse. And so when the seen us, they started running, you know, going the other way. And there wasn't but three or four of us, there wasn't many men, but there wasn't many of them either. So they, they went off and they left. And when they left, we went on to the courthouse. There was nobody there, it was empty. And so the flag was there, so I went outside and I just said, well, I'm going to get me a souvenir. I just pulled the flag down. I stuck it in my duffel bag. <laughs> I stayed in there until I came back home. Did you show it to many people when you Never got home? Never showed it to nobody. No? Mm -mm. Charles was known for being a dead-on shot. His basic training scores earned him marks as an expert rifleman. Were you a pretty good sharpshooter in Europe? Oh, yeah. I didn't miss. He lived on K-rations for a good part of two years, but there was one time in Germany where he and a cook had a conversation. He said, what are we going to eat? And it was sort of a, a valley, a hill in a valley, and they had a little creek down through there. And so he looked at me and said, think you can kill one of them deers? I said, if he shows his head, I can get him. So he said, well, kill us some meat. So me and a couple of the other boys went out on the side of that hill, and we were looking through there. We seen some deer coming down that little valley eating grass and going to that water. So we picked off two of them, I shot them, brought them back there, and we had a big, big piece. Coming back home to Louisiana was not an easy transition, but it was made easier with the help of his wife, Frances. Like I said, I had nightmares at, at home. I, and my wife can tell you that. I, I, I tore the window out of the house one time. On the Christmas Eve or New Year's, I don't remember. But there was fire, firecrackers, and it looked like there was an you know, attack. And I broke through the window, and I, I heard a big noise, like tanks, and there was a freight train passing on the track back of the house. And I was running, I was jumping the fence back there. When I heard a harm that that meant I woke up. Today, sometimes I'll dream, you know, you know, just not much, but sometimes I'll dream something like that. But it's not, not nothing like then. And perhaps the bravest action of all was to write down some of those World War II memories. Memories on these 24 pages that would remind him of a time he would rather forget. Times when mortar shells fell like rain, moving up a country road on your stomach to face the enemy 15 yards away. Or all the death, so much death, day in and day out for two years. On his final page, Charles wrote, the war ended while I was in the hospital. The war ended, so here I am, on my way home now. Some hell I saw. I'm getting to where I don't mind it a little bit. I mean, it's, I don't know if my mind is changing or what, but I mean, I'm not, I'm not too bashful about it no more. Because there's just a lot, a lot of things that we went through that, that I ain't never said or you can't say. It would take days to, see, to find out know all about it. There's a lot of things. Charles Bro would return home to Crot Springs after the war. And folks in those parts probably know him best as the owner of Bro's Fishing Market for nearly 30 years. Next, we profile a retired New Orleans social worker by the name of Joseph Casson. Joseph is a survivor of the Bataan Death March. Casson was a prisoner of war for over three years. One of his sources of strength during these horrific days would come from a 19th century English poet. On December 7, 1941, the Imperial Japanese Navy caught the United States by surprise at Pearl Harbor. Five U.S. Navy battleships were destroyed, and over 2,300 U.S. soldiers died. Franklin Delano Roosevelt called December 7, 1941, a date that will live in infamy. But a lesser known fact of World War II history is what the Japanese did next. Just hours after Pearl Harbor, they took their air power over the Philippines 
and attacked U.S. military bases there. The peacetime forces of the United States were no match to the superior Japanese military. Thousands of American and Filipino troops retreated from Manila to the Bataan Peninsula. After holding out for three months, it was here where American troops would surrender to the Japanese. 86-year-old Joseph Kassin was one of those soldiers. The night of the, of the uh, capture, we were uh, scheduled, we were stationed at Bataan Airfield, which was just a short distance from Arvelis. American soldiers were prisoners of war, but the POW camps were as far as 100 miles away. The soldiers, many suffering with malaria and malnutrition, were forced to walk to the camps. This journey would be known as the Bataan Death March. How long did that march last? I'm figuring it took 10 days. But, uh, I don't know, I, I passed out the last day. You find all kinds of atrocities uh, where guys were, uh, were bayoneted or, or killed or shot. Uh, and the Japanese had a peculiar method if they wa wanted to execute anybody, they had him dig his own grave in front of a fence, a barbed wire fence. During the death march, a fellow soldier drank all of Kassin's canteen of iodized water, but a patch of sugar cane along the side of the road provided a glimmer of hope. I made up, made up my mind that I was going to take a chance at that uh, sugar cane patch. And for some reason, a whole bunch of us broke and ran for the patch. And I thought I had to have something to replace that water. And uh, I, got, I managed to get a piece of sugar cane and grabbed it and ran back. And nobody, nobody stopped me or tormented me. And uh, I, I thank my good fortune for that. For Kassin, good fortune also came at the hands of another soldier from his squadron named Homer. There was a section that we had to stop and uh, take a rest. He, uh, he told me to come over and share his blanket. It was raining at the time, and he had uh, uh, an army blanket. And uh, I was grateful for his offering that. So I got under the blanket with him and shared the blanket. And I thought, well, it can't be all bad. The guy, the guy with the water was one thing, but this, this was something else. Kasson spent roughly a year and a half in two POW camps, Camp O'Donnell and Cabanatawan. He was then moved to a work camp in the Japanese coal mines. When you got to the coal mine entrance, you went to a cable car and uh, they rode you down as far as whatever level you had to go to. And uh, you never knew whether you were going to come up again or not. They, the Japanese had uh, these vases uh, where they put the remains of guys that were cremated uh, who were who had died in the accident in the mine and uh, we had a, a hell of a lot of them up there and uh, there was a there was a guy named Kit Carson he broke his back he never recovered and they put him in the jug in all this time when you were a POW, Joe, what kept you going? Uh, there was some poetry. Uh, this, uh, did you ever read a, a poem called Invictus? No, sir. Out of the night that covers me, black as a pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my end conquerable soul. And that's, that's what I was reciting to myself. Casson repeatedly recited the poem Invictus by British poet William Ernest Henley. 
Invictus is Latin for unconquered. The final lines read, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. After working two years in the coal mines, the war ended. Kassin survived. The Japanese closed down the coal mine and uh, they called us all out on the compound at the camp and they lined us all up and they told us that the war was over and our wonderful country had won the war and we would soon be going home to our loved ones. Well, we heard that kind of before, but uh, we, uh, they told us that uh, they were getting ready to leave and they were going to leave us in charge of our, uh, our own troops. Kassin met up with Navy forces in Yokohama and would soon return home. They uh, deloused us and uh, gave us some clean clothes and uh, gave us all we wanted to eat and ice cream and cake and cookies and uh, anything else we wanted. I got to San Francisco and I I think I got a troop train to Camp Devons. From Camp Devons, my mother and sister came to see me, and uh, I think I weighed about 105 pounds, or 140 at that time. My mother passed out, and my sister asked how I was doing. And uh, then, shortly after that, I. Uh, got permission to go home. Joseph Kassin has endured and learned more than most can imagine. He is unconquered. He is Invictus. Don't, don't lose hope on anything because there's always a chance. Shortly before the end of World War II, it was uncertain if the Japanese would kill American POWs. The Army mobilized the 6th Ranger Battalion for a rescue at Cabanatuan. Of the tens of thousands of troops taken prisoner in Bataan, 513 POWs were freed by the 6th Ranger Battalion. Next, we focus on a prisoner of war from Louisiana who was also one of the youngest B-17 bomber pilots to serve in World War II. Most people in Franklinton, Louisiana, know Bill Babington as the man who ran the town's pharmacy for 50 years. But before he was filling prescriptions, Lieutenant Babington was running missions over Europe. Bill Babington began his military career with a lie. At age 19, Babington wanted to enlist in the Army Air Corps as a cadet. But you had to have two years of college, and I lied because I didn't have it. I had one semester course at Tulane, but I told them I took correspondence, I knew they wouldn't check it, and I had to take a test, and I passed the test. Babington dreamed of becoming a fighter pilot. The first flight of his life was in military flight school, in a crop duster. We went up, met with my, all the instructors there were ex-cotton dusters. This was a field, it's all civilians training, so they, uh, Went up the first time and just fly around. And that's the first time I've ever been in an airplane. And so he, he said, he hollered, he, no communications. He hollered back, you want to do a snap roll? I said, yeah, I didn't know what that was. And then he said, slow roll. And well, then it went, when he got upside down, I was scared to death. So he said, have you ever flown before? I said, no. He said, so he came on back. Eventually, Babington was given orders to select a crew to fly B-17 bombers over Europe. Bill was still 19. For what type of training then for the B-17 did you have? Supposedly, but I flew as a co-pilot. He was supposed to have taught me a lot, but he didn't. It was, um, you might say, just learning as you go. Remember, I'm 19 years old. <laughs> I got my crew together and I said, no. This is the situation. I think I can fly this airplane, but I, you know I hadn't had a lot of training. But I think we can walk away from all the landings. But if any of y'all want to transfer, I'll do my best to 
accommodate you. They kind of looked around and said, let's stick it out. B-17 crews consisted of 10 men. Babington would fly 17 missions over Europe. The squadron was a close-knit bunch, but one time he needed a substitute tail gunner for a mission. He must have been 30-some-odd years old. <clears throat> Couldn't speak two words without cussing. And so when you pre-flight the plane and all, and a couple of crewmen came back and said, Captain, he said, you know, it's real bad. He said, we're having prayer. And they, he's back there just cussing. <laughs> so I said, oh, boy. So here's this 20-year-old going up to this guy, and I, I said, now, Scotty, you got to cool it. So I told him what, you know, what he was doing. He said, are we flying combat to go into Sunday school? <laughs> I said, we're flying combat, but cool it. What was it like to fly a B-17? It was a wonderful airplane. It could take a lot of, a lot of damage and still fly. But it was, because uh, he had no heat. You, and it was not, not pressurized. You wore an oxygen mask and a throat mic when you're flying. And uh, you get up at 25, 30,000 feet, it may be 60 below zero. And you're supposed to have a heated boots and all, but they didn't work half the time. It's very, very cold. On March 8, 1944, Babington's B-17 went down during a bombing mission in Germany. When I realized I couldn't fly much longer, I picked out a nice field to land in, but I couldn't make it, and I ended up landing in a plowed field. But it was a good landing. Everybody walked away. One of my better landings. A bomber Dan and I took off. I thought, and we saw some people with wooden shoes. So I thought I was in Holland, because I thought that's where the war wouldn't choose. They were in Germany, too. <laughs> anyway, we got picked up by civilians after about three hours. Babington would be taken to Stalag Luft 1, located near the Baltic Sea. He was a prisoner of war for 14 months. Did you hear word from the outside world? You could bribe the German guards, and they got a radio with cigarettes. Cigarettes was the medium of exchange. And we bought, the, and so we, we even published a newspaper every day. And so we, we knew what, exactly what was going on. Babington was released from the camp when the war ended. And when he came back home, he reunited with his father, mother, and sister in New Orleans. But at the reunion, his family was holding back. I had a Dear John letter when I got home. <laughs> because I, I didn't know it was a Dear John letter. Cause I met this girl in New York and just dated her half a dozen times, but she thought I was going to marry her when I got home. And she wrote the letter and said she wasn't going to be there. And they were very reluctant to tell me about it. <laughs> but, uh, How were you about it? Oh, I didn't, I didn't, I couldn't even think of her last name. <laughs> and last spring, Babington took his three children to retrace many of his World War II steps. He was treated as a hero everywhere he went. And I'll tell you this, I was treated royal every place I went. Barry St. Edmunds, and then in, uh, in, uh, at Normandy, I mean, being a veteran, there not too many of us left. <laughs> and they, they were very, very nice. In the pub we went to, they had me sign the wall. And, wouldn't even let me pay for my drinks. I mean, they were just real, treating me first class. Now, why did you feel it important enough to bring your family to these places? I thought they would enjoy it, and they did. I mean, they think I'm a real big hero now. Bill Babington was true to his word. One of his fondest wartime memories that gives him great pride is the fact that every crew member survived all 17 missions he flew in Europe. Apart from the free drinks recently in Normandy, Babington received many honors, including the Air Medal, two oak leaf clusters, and the Distinguished Lion Cross. Stay tuned. We have more Louisiana World War II stories coming up on Louisiana Public Broadcasting.
Welcome back to Louisiana World War II Stories. I'm your host, Charlie Winham, coming to you from the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. Our next profile is a Shreveport man by the name of Dr. Donald Webb. He is quite a unique fellow. His resume includes being a preacher, professor, and college president of a popular Louisiana college. Dr. Webb served in World War II, but not for the United States. Up in northern Louisiana, there is a World War II veteran that captained a Navy minesweeper and then became a preacher. Donald Webb is the retired president of Centenary College in Shreveport, and his World War II experience came from the other side of the Atlantic. You see, Mr. Webb is an Englishman. He served in the British Royal Navy. Webb grew up in South Wales, about 80 miles from London. He witnessed the German Blitzkrieg firsthand as a teenager. Very few towns in England uh, were not attacked. And uh, if we, we were on a main road, and uh, so uh, if there'd been a raid somewhere else and, and the German planes were heading for the coast, uh, they could follow this Roman road and to the coast and drop their excess stuff on us and um, so we didn't have many uh, deliberate raids I think but we had lots of uh, incidental ones. The Blitz of course tragic and and say coming home from school at lunchtime and the air raid sirens would go and you'd throw your bike down and you'd jump into an air raid shelter and the planes would do what they were going to do bombs or machine guns and then the all clear would go and you'd go out and cycle on home. Webb fondly recalls the day he rode home from school to find his mother had adopted three Jewish refugee children who escaped from Germany. And so when I got home from school, I had a brother, Izzy, and uh, two sisters. When they could, uh, could explain in English to us what had happened, their mother, the father had been a baker in Berlin, my mother had uh, sold uh, possessions and taken them to the railroad station in early evening when it was quiet given a conductor a sum of money and said, please uh, take these somewhere safe. Webb attended Cambridge. He joined the Navy and at age 23 was captain of the HMS Switha. Joining the Navy was an incredible experience. We three, 300 of us left Cambridge to join the Navy and we were so arrogant. Cambridge people are very arrogant. Uh, and um, the difference between an Oxford man and a Cambridge man is an Oxford man walks down the street looking as if he owned the place. Cambridge man walks down the street look, looking as if he didn't care who owned the place. We were going to take over the Navy, we 300, and they broke us into little bits and put us together uh, in the way they wanted. <laughs> and it was quite an experience. When I say World War II and the personalities that, were, that made it, what comes to mind? First of all, of personalities, it would have to be a vision of Winston Churchill. To me, he was the epitome of the leader. The fact that he could, by making half a dozen speeches on radio, motivate us. I could see my father standing up straight. You know, the neighbors looked different. And this man was incredible, and, and he was so often um, right in the sense that he could go right to the heart of a matter. After the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, the United States joined the Allied forces and gave the Brits the first signs of hope that Axis powers of Germany, Italy, and Japan could be defeated. We knew that the war would now be won. And that was all the difference in the world. Now there was no doubt in our mind. That is not to say Webb's contact with the American soldiers as a Cambridge student did not have their moments. And they were so different from British Tommies. They were, uh, they were so free and easy. On the other hand, um, you know, uh, there were negatives in the sense, in socially, in the sense that they were, you know, the old saying was they were um, overpaid, uh, oversexed and over here. All we knew was the Americans were now in and that meant we were going to win. And uh, so there was a tremendous sense of confidence now. Um, we, a joy even. So um, personal little problems with, uh, with individuals who went out with one's girlfriend but nothing 
you know, the overall thing was just exhilaration. And when the war ended, Webb and his fellow Englishmen celebrated in typical British style. I remember one of uh, England's, uh, well, she was the first lady, member of parliament, Lady Astor. She, and a teetotaler, she uh, erected a cocoa stand on Plymouth Hoe uh, to encourage the sailors to celebrate with cocoa. And most of us felt so good about her that we drank a little cocoa, but then went for the nearest pub and had a pint. 13 years later, Webb and his wife Renee and their three children immigrated to the United States. Webb studied to become a minister. In 1977, Webb became president of Centenary College. Tell me a little bit about Centenary College, the elements of this school that you're most proud of. Well, academically, it's, uh, it's excellent. It's, uh, it's not so much that it's tremendously difficult to get in as a student, but the faculty-student ratio and the quality of the faculty means that you're going to have a great education and when you leave here you're going to be ready for whatever it is. There's a fine uh, pre-med program, pre-law, music program, church, careers program. Uh, people get uh, a good education here. And downstairs at the Centenary College Library, one stop at the Donald A. Webb Seminar Room reflects the admiration and respect the school still maintains for their former president. This former Navy officer has anchored a solid future for Centenary College. It is regularly listed at the top of its class in annual college rankings. You consider yourself a Southerner? You consider yourself a Yankee now? Oh, in, this, in the English sense, yes, I am. I'm definitely an American. Oh, we love it. We, we've never looked back. We have never looked back. Plus, we have five children, nine grandchildren, four great-grandchildren. Who's going to move to a, another place? Dr. Webb and his wife, Renee, still make it back to England regularly, and he tells me his British friends make fun of his American accent. Dr. Webb retired from Centenary College in 1991, but still remains quite busy in community programs throughout Shreveport. There is another Shreveport man who served in the U.S. Navy with plenty of World War II stories. 86-year-old John Isles Jr. was a PT boat captain, and during his time in the service, his path crossed with some of the most famous people of the 20th century. <laughs> the, only, the only experience I ever had with water, you know, was r rowing my grandpa in a, in a P-Rogue down in, our, in Baton Rouge. The world of John Isles Jr. would change forever when he joined the Navy and served in World War II. Isles was captain of PT Boat 105, and he became good friends with the man who drove PT Boat 109, a fellow from the Northeast named Jack Kennedy. I stood there and watched that man do sign this. You knew John F. Kennedy? Oh, I knew him. Yeah, he was my partner. Mm -hmm. Well, that has to be a, a family treasure, a family heirloom. Oh, that is. That is. I don't know who's going to get that. <laughs> or, the, or the 105. That's the 105 right there. That's, that was my boat. Isles and Kennedy first met in Rhode Island when the two were training. Isles recalls having trouble getting adjusted to the cold climate of the North. It was in the dead of winter of 1942, so I, I was freezing. And I woke him up. I said, Yankee boy, I said, you got to tell me how you all exist up here because I can't, I can't take this cold weather. And he got up and he remade my bed. He put some newspaper underneath the bed, underneath the mattress, and I went down and went sound off to sleep. He was just a personable fella. You know, the, some fellow that you just plain like? Well, that was the type of fellow he was. I got my orders first. I got, and he got his orders to go to Jacksonville, to the Huckins Squadron, sort of a shakedown outfit. Just, uh, but I got my orders to go to to uh, Tulagi, right off of Guadalcanal. And, um, oh, he used to, that's how, we, we call, that's how he got his nickname, Shafty, because he was, oh, he was, a, when he got to griping, he could gripe sadder than anybody I've ever heard. So we started calling him Shafty because he got the shaft, you know. 
you got to go to the Solomons. And he says, I got the Huckins squadron. During their time in the South Pacific, Isles became good buddies with Shafty. At night, a lot of, you know, a lot of times we, we couldn't sleep worth a damn. And <clears throat> we'd talk, and I'd tell him all about my family, and he'd tell me all about his family, and, and we, we got to know our families pretty well. In fact, he took the trouble to call my mother when he came back to the States, and he came back before I did. When I got home, I told a lot of my dear friends, uh, who were, some of them very active in politics, and uh, I told them about this fella that I had known, and I'd met in the service, and, and, and how he was going to be president someday. If Kennedy was shafty, Isles could easily have earned well, the nickname crafty, especially in times of avoiding Japanese fire. But they shot a lot at us, but they didn't hit us. I know, it, like they, they got to, they got to shooting at us with a big, big howitzer, and they'd shoot over here. You see, but what I was, I was running the wheel at that time for Mr. Kersey, and I'd, I'd go to where the bullet, where the shell fell, and exploded, because I knew the Japanese were going to change their their deflection and their range after they hit. So then they hit over here. So I'd go over there, and we got finally we got out of range. <laughs> oh man, it was nice. I'll serve tours in the Pacific and European theaters, but it was his third assignment that took him to a movie set in Miami. He drove a PT boat in the John Ford film They Were Expendable. The movie starred Robert Montgomery, Ward Bond, Donna Reed, and John Wayne. <laughs> he didn't. He didn't act. He just was John Wayne, and uh, I know one time he was kind of, I think he must have been kind of hung over because he, <clears throat> he was having to do it over and over and over, and finally Mr. Ford, John Ford says, goodness gracious, and that didn't want to say it, he said to else. he says, I should have hired an actor for that job. <laughs> he loved him like a son, though, he would have done anything in the world for Wayne. He made Wayne, you know. If you ever saw the movie, it would be John Wayne, rah, you know, just yelling and screaming, let's go, let's go, fire one, fire two. Well, you never fired a torpedo going full speed. You always dropped them off going about three or four knots. That's the way you fired torpedoes. But in that movie, they were, man, fire one. Fire two, and uh, it, it worked good because it's a very it's a it's considered a classic movie. I was more impressed with Robert Montgomery. He was more uh, my vintage. He was an old PT boat officer, and uh, but he was a, he was Robert Montgomery was a he was the ideal of a gentleman. After the war, Isles would return to Louisiana and made a home in Shreveport. He also stayed in touch with his Navy buddy, now living in D.C. Did you ever visit him in D.C.? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I saw him about a month before he was killed. And, you know, it's a funny thing. I told him, I said, for, he's told, he told me, he said, I'm going to be down in your country next, next month, in, a, in about a month. And I said, yeah, where are you going? He said, I'm going to Dallas. I said, well, for God's sakes, Jack, stay off of Highway 80. But people on Highway 80 just did not like it. And, it was, it was, and that, he was killed on Highway 80. Now, that was no premonition. There was no inspiration. I just, I just knew that, that Highway 80 people didn't like Jack. Back inside John's study, the memories of a remarkable personal history are preserved for future generations of the Isles family. And he did sign it. You saw him. Uh, sign oh yeah, that, he, that, that is bona fide. I don't know. I don't know what that's worth. Oh my goodness. I, I'd hate to think about what that's worth. From PT boats to presidents to movie stars, the life of John Isles Jr. is filled with priceless encounters. Let's drag our tails out of here. John Isles Jr. was treated like a movie star at Centenary College recently. 
the Robinson Film Center hosted a special screening of the movie, They Were Expendable. And after the movie, Mr. Isles took questions from the audience about his experience with the likes of JFK, John Wayne, and director John Ford. Well, now it is time to change scenes and head to Cane River Country. From the steps of the St. Augustine Catholic Church in Isleboroughville, we meet up with three black men who served in the Army, Navy, and Merchant Marines. These men represent some of the challenges of the black American soldiers. They fought a war on two fronts. There was the enemy overseas, as well as the battle against prejudice back home. St. Augustine Catholic Church was established on the banks of the Cane River in 1803. It is here where we find three Creole men reminiscing World War II history. Pajo, Tony, and John are in their 80s now. All three had different experiences. Louis P. Christoph worked cotton fields for his father to then serve in Patton's Third Army working laundry detail for an evacuation hospital. The front lines of the battlefield was just miles away. I was always close to the battlefront. You could hear the shooting and, and the German planes coming down when the Americans would take them down, or either our plane. The Germans would take them down. You could see them. Oh, there, that's another one gone. General Patton kept going, kept moving his troops forward, and shooting the Germans, bombing the cities, the towns, or whatever we were passing in. And there was a lot of wounded soldiers, so they would bring them back to the evacuation hospital. We were not one evacuation hospital. They had two of us up in there. And, uh, that was enough to keep them halfway clean. Not the way they should be, but the best that we could do. John Overton Conant had been in the cleaning business all his life. He served in the Navy and was drafted at age 20. John worked on a boat that carried parts and cargo to U.S. submarines. His main duty was feeding the officers and keeping their quarters clean. Born and raised in Natchitoches, Conant was in the service for less than a year when peace broke. The only thing I had close call with, I was going down, we slept down the third deck. I was going down so fast to come back up to watch the movie, I cut my head on, on, on the buck head. They had to put eight stitches in it. <laughs> Anthony Arsenault was born in New Orleans and decided to join the Merchant Marines. He worked on various cargo and passenger ships that would drop off U.S. troops, supplies, and ammunition all over the world. For Tony, the Merchant Marines offered freedom. You was free to come and go like you wanted. If I'd have gotten an army or a navy or something drafted, well, you'd be in the service and you'd be restricted. But on a Merchant Marine, you went and came and go like you wanted to. Arsenault was regularly in hot zones. In 1942, he was aboard the Robert E. Lee's last voyage. As it was heading towards the mouth of the Mississippi, a German submarine lurking along the Gulf shore sunk the vessel. German subs had sunk 56 ships that year in the Gulf. You, you hear, you, you see a periscope that the fins coming and awaken that water, that torpedo, and then all I want you to hear that Boom, and then everything is just gone. You either knocked overboard or whatever, you see. And, and me and uh, Winnie was knocked overboard, and George and them, they got killed and thing. And and uh, this other guy from the office got killed. It's all friends of mine. In addition to facing the enemy overseas, black soldiers faced the irony of serving their country only to come back home to face discrimination and racism. Sure, a lot of times, what the hell, heck am I doing here? And my poor mama and papa, sister and brother back here could not, you know, go here or go there with this segregation going on. Yeah, you thought about that a lot. During the war, Anthony Arsenault would hear racist remarks from white soldiers. He was an amateur boxer, but kept his fights in the ring. And a lot of discrimination, and they would bring it on themselves, you know, because they would down you. They would talk about the blacks had tails and all that kind of mess, and they were just a 
there, but you could go where you wanted when you got in them countries. You didn't have all that foolishness. After the war, Tony turned professional and fought as a featherweight and was known as Kid Arsenault. Pajo remembers the end of the war. He was in Germany making fast friends with Allied soldiers. The Polish uh, soldiers, mm -hmm. they were in that town and they found something to drink, some of Hitler's, uh, I don't know why did they let them drink it, but it was good. It didn't kill nobody. How did you celebrate? Well, the same way we hooped and hollered. No, we were just so happy and elated that this thing was over with. I was glad to be back. And I was a staff sergeant then, big, walking with my chest out, <laughs> making a nice little paycheck. And uh, I got promoted to staff sergeant somewhere over there in Europe. And when John Conant arrived home, it was about one or two in the morning, and he didn't want to wake up anybody, including his wife. <laughs> I sneaked in the house, and I got in the bed, and I went to bed. <laughs> yeah, I was tired. I would beat, I would beat them. Yeah, I would beat. Yeah. But I was glad to get home, <laughs> I'll tell you that. Yeah, really was. So your wife didn't see you until the morning, sleeping next to you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> was she surprised? Uh, was she surprised? Oh, yes, she was surprised. She wasn't looking for me. At that, at, at, she knew I was coming home, but she didn't know what time, you see. And it is now time for these three men to return home to the Cane River area for good. It is a place to share stories, not just of World War II, but of all other things that have happened since. Historian Stephen Ambrose said black soldiers were fighting the world's worst racists in the world's most segregated army, and the irony did not go unnoticed. The success of black combat units such as the Tuskegee Airmen and Buffalo Soldiers led President Harry Truman to integrate the military in 1948. Black soldiers, however, were still kept in separate units during the Korean War, which lasted until 1953. Next, it is time to head to Acadiana because there is a very special group that is dedicated to giving World War II veterans a day to remember. Thanks to an organization called Louisiana Honor Air, World War II veterans have the chance to see the World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C. In a whirlwind one-day trip held the weekend before Veterans Day of 07, Louisiana World War II veterans took over the town. The trip was full of storytelling, reflection, as well as a few surprises. Come on guys, let's go. Head them up, move them out. There was no need for a sunrise bugler. The booming voice of Lafayette radio personality, T.D. Smith, was up to the challenge. Good morning, Mr. Richard. It's a beautiful day. Isn't it? Smith, along with other community leaders and volunteers, have put together a program called Louisiana Honor Air. Their purpose is to take any World War II veteran physically able to travel to Washington, D.C. and visit the World War II Memorial. For many, it is the first and only opportunity they will see it. In the pre-dawn hours on the first Saturday in November, 81 veterans awaited their chartered flight at the Lafayette Regional Airport. Mr. Richard, when you get in, I want you to go straight to the back and get you, for the veterans to get their picture taken. As they boarded their U.S. Airways jet, an honor guard of active duty soldiers lined the gateway, holding a salute for nearly 30 minutes. The veterans knew they were on a one-day trip to D.C., but they had no idea of what awaited them. And thanks to Louisiana Honor Air, these Louisiana World War II veterans were treated like the heroes that they are. The ground crew at Reagan National Airport knew they were coming. They were not the only ones. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I see the first of our veterans coming off the flight. Give them a big 
welcome as they deplay. Moments after landing, the Louisiana World War II veterans received a hero's welcome from total strangers. Some were employees of U.S. Airways, others members of the American Legion, and then there were just people who heard about these special trips and simply wanted to be there and say thank you. Next, the veterans boarded a bus that would take them to the World War II Memorial. The memorial opened in the spring of 2004. It consists of 17-foot-high pillars arranged in a semicircle. Each pillar represents the 48 states and U.S. territories during the time of World War II. Understandably, the veterans gravitated to the Louisiana pillar. It's nice. I never thought they could have built something that nice for the World War II veteran, but it's really nice. I surely appreciate it. It's wonderful. It costs a couple of nickels, though. <laughs> a few nickels, yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to come at first because I flew a few times, but I didn't care to fly, and someone convinced me to come, and I'm glad I did. In fact, I, like when we left Lafayette with the honor guard, it almost made tears come to your eyes. What really impressed me this morning, Charles, was our welcome. Oh, that was a, that was a thumbs up welcome, and I just felt real good about it. That was surprising, wasn't yes, it? Yes, it was. I expected a few hoorahs, but not that many. But it was good. I was tickled to death to get off that airplane. <laughs> That's the first time I've ever been on one. And I, I wasn't scared, but I was concerned. <laughs> So I was happy when we landed. The Louisiana World War II veterans walked the memorial for over an hour. It was an opportunity to reflect upon another time and another place. 86-year-old Irwin Bro of Crowley was a Buffalo soldier, a black man in the 40s fighting a war on two fronts. Irwin served in the 92nd Division and battled the enemy in Europe, only to return to the States and fight prejudice at home. It's very important. People know, should know what a soldier go through. Then you go back home and you got to go through a lot of crap. Yet you didn't went and fought a war for them. Are you getting any thank yous today? I'm getting plenty. Uh, I'm enjoying it. I'm getting a lot of it. People that don't even know me, they see me, they say, hey, you that Buffalo soldier? I says, yeah. Come hug me, kiss me. Very much. I never thought I'd see that day, but it's here. Yeah. The northern end of the memorial is dedicated to the European theater. The south side is dedicated to the Pacific theater. This is the backdrop to a sobering reality, hearing World War II stories from the soldiers themselves. We were all uh, uh, trying to sing them uh, submarines they had. Oh, you were submarine hunters. Yeah, that's okay. right. That's what we did. How many subs did y'all get? Well, uh, I didn't count them. Sometimes you didn't know, probably. Well, you right. weren't sure yet. Well, to... yeah, you, we knew because the, the clothes would come floating on top of the... Oh, yeah, yeah. On yeah. top of the water. They knew, they knew how many there were. Well, all in clothes or whatever, right. yeah. Were you wounded? Yes, I was. I was, I was knocked out by a motor shell. And mm -hmm. I was damn lucky I survived. You had shrapnel from the shell? No, I didn't get shrap shrapnel, but I had a friend of mine that was next next to me. He got hit. He'd got a hole in his helmet that big. Mm -hmm. So he didn't make it? Oh, no. Yeah. He didn't make it. So uh, you spent some time in the hospital? Yes. Is this medal right here, the Purple Heart, is yeah. that because of the... Yeah. Very good. And so you, your entire tour was in Italy? That's right. Did you drink a little Italian wine? Oh, I drank plenty of stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Italian wine. A little uh, yeah. meatball of spaghetti? They have, in Italy, they have a drink they call Strega. 
and uh, that's uh, that's a uh, white lightning. White lightning. And you, you drink that, and you want to fight with the wolves. Oh, yeah. <laughs> my dad was in the Pacific Theater. My father-in-law was in the European Theater. So I got them both here, so they can see the sacrifices they made. I we appreciate it. I'm just honored. It, it, I get choked up thinking about it. They made some great sacrifices. We live in a free country because of these men right here and, and the other veterans that we're here with. The people that paid for this, because myself, I couldn't afford it now I, at all, because I was an electrician by trade. And a lot of a lot of fellas couldn't have made it if they, if, if, if there wouldn't have been a hand put in. Former Senate Majority Leader and fellow World War II veteran Bob Dole also spent time with the Louisiana vets. We got all these Louisiana guys there. We're taking yeah. over. That's it. All right. Well, let's turn around so we get him in the memorial picture. And after the photo op with Senator Dole, the Louisiana veterans traveled to Arlington National Cemetery to lay a wreath on the tomb of the unknown soldier. It was 7 p.m. back at Reagan National Airport, nearly 14 hours since their day began. It was time to come back home to Louisiana, but once again, they had no idea what awaited them. Their night in Lafayette ended the same way as their day began in Washington, D.C. The Louisiana veterans faced a throng of adoring fans. To date, Louisiana Otter Air has flown five missions. Over 400 Louisiana World War II veterans have seen their memorial. This was the fifth and last flight of the year. More flights and more fanfare are scheduled for 2008. Louisiana Honor Air raised close to $300,000 for five trips to D.C. If you would like to make a donation or find out more on the trips to the Capitol next year, go to their webpage at louisianahonorair.com or you can call the Community Foundation of Acadiana at 337-266-2145. And remember to come to New Orleans and visit the National World War II Museum. It is a memorable experience for all generations and should not be missed on any visit to New Orleans. For more information on the museum, you can go to their webpage at nationalww2museum.org. For everyone at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, thanks for watching.